The Moving Coffin is a scary story about two boys and haunted house. Tom Bridges, Harry Worth, and John Springer were friends and rivals. They were always trying to best one another in something, in school, in sports, with girls, whatever. There was no dare that one could accept without the others accepting as well. And so it was inevitable that they should finally confront the old Gareth place. The old Gareth place was a haunted house. Now, every town, every neighborhood, has some sort of haunted house. Usually it's just an old house that nobody has lived in for a long time. Kids make up stories about it, and they run and scream every time they get near it. So the place gets the reputation of being a haunted house, though no ghost has ever been seen, and nothing horrible ever really happened in the house. The Gareth place was different it had a history. It was a big Victorian-style house set on top of a hill. At one time it had been quite a show place, for the Gareths were just about the richest people around. There had been parties in the house and a regular stream of visitors. But all that changed after young Winston Gareth died. His was a tragic death, a boating accident. Actually, the boy's body was never found, and his parents kept hoping, even believing, that he would somehow miraculously turn up alive. Of course, he never did. Winston had been their darling, and psychologically his parents simply couldn't handle the fact of his death. Slowly the Gareths began to withdraw from their friends and neighbors. There were no more parties, even close friends weren't invited over. The Gareths had become so gloomy and morbid that nobody really wanted to visit them anyway. The lawns weren't cut, the paint began to peel, and the Gareth place just generally went to pot. The Gareths themselves rarely went out. Every once in a while someone would catch a glimpse of them in the market. They seemed to have aged unnaturally, and become very grey and gaunt. They didn't speak to anyone, even people they had once known well, and no one tried to speak to them. Their visits to the market became less frequent, and finally only Mrs. Gareth was seen. The process was so gradual that no one could be quite sure when they had last seen Mr. Gareth, and no one was particularly curious about him anymore. Then people stopped seeing Mrs. Gareth as well. Once again no one was quite sure when they had stopped seeing her. No one really noticed. Slowly, very slowly, it dawned on people that no one had even seen a light on in the house for months. And someone got the bright idea that with two old people up in that big house alone, something might be wrong. So one day the police marched up to the house and knocked on the door. No answer. They knocked harder. Still no answer. Now they were sure something was wrong, and they decided to break the door down. As soon as the police got through the door they knew what was wrong, because the smell nearly knocked them over. They found Mrs. Gareth, or what was left of her, in the bedroom. She must have been dead for weeks, and it was the middle of the summer. Her body was half rotted away and covered with maggots. One of the cruder young cops commented that you would never have believed that there could have been so much rotting meat on that bony old body. They had to remove the remains in one of those rubber body bags that are used at plane crashes, and everybody wore hospital masks. That left old Mr. Gareth. The police searched the house, and they found him too. He was in the cellar, also dead, but he was neatly laid out in a coffin. The medical examiner was able to determine that he had died years before his wife. Somehow she had managed to embalm the body herself and preserve it. It wasn't perfectly preserved. It looked more like a dried out mummy with a little skin and flesh stretched tight over the bones. But it was still recognizably human, still recognizably Mr. Gareth. She had lived all those years alone in the big house with her husband's preserved body in the cellar. The house had been deserted ever since the discovery was made. Real estate agents wouldn't even go into it. People swore it was haunted and strange noises could be heard there from time to time. That was the old Gareth place, and that was the house that Tom Bridges, Harry Worth, and John Springer decided to confront. No one was quite sure whose idea it was in the first place to spend the night there. Probably Tom's, he was always the boldest. But as soon as he proposed the plan the others had to go along. No one could admit he was afraid, though they all were. 
The three boys brought sleeping bags and flashlights to the house. Tom also brought his hunting knife. Harry had a baseball bat. But John didn't bring any weapon at all. He said that if the place was really haunted then the weapons wouldn't be of any use against ghosts, and if it wasn't haunted then who needed weapons? Faultless logic, but Tom and Harry gripped their weapons anyway. The boys put their sleeping bags in the dining room and tried to get some sleep. For quite a while they lay awake listening to the creaking and groaning of the old house. Windows rattled, rats scurried about in the walls. All of these noises sounded strange and ghostly to the three boys, but they managed to tell one another that all the sounds were natural. Then there came a loud bang, and another. These sounds could not be explained away as rats or wind. Something heavy was being moved in the cellar the very cellar in which old man Garetha's body had been kept in its coffin for so many years. Though each of the boys wanted to run out of the house more than anything in the world, not one of them could be the first to run. They sat there and waited for more sounds in the cellar until finally Tom said, we'd better go down and see what's going on. They grabbed their flashlights, Tom clutched his knife and Harry his baseball bat, and they headed for the cellar stairs. The beams of their lights could only illuminate a small part of the cellar at a time, so it was a minute or so before they saw it, the coffin. The coffin was lying flat on the ground. The coffin alone was bad enough, but it was moving, rocking back and forth, as though it was somehow trying to stand up. And then it did. With tremendous effort the coffin managed to stand up on end, and once again it began to move. It moved slowly at first, one edge pushed unsteadily forward, then the other and it seemed to gain strength and speed. It was moving right toward the three boys at the bottom of the stairs. It was almost on them when Tom screamed, dropped his knife and flashlight, and fled up the stairs and out of the house. A second later it was Harry's turn. He dropped his baseball bat and flashlight and ran. That left John, the only one without a weapon. Relentlessly the coffin moved toward him, and quite calmly John reached into his pocket, pulled out a box of Smith Brothers cough drops, popped one into his mouth and the coffin stopped. The Scarecrow is a scary story about a farmer who builds the scariest and most hideous of all scarecrows to take care of his farm. There was an old farmer in Arizona who owned the best farm in the area. Everybody said his crops were the best and people came from all over to buy their goods from him. Whenever people asked him how he was able to grow such good quality crops, the old farmer would say it was all down to his scarecrow. That old scarecrow is the one I have to thank, said the farmer. He makes sure no crows or critters or pests come near my crops. The old farmer had built the scarecrow himself and it was a fearsome sight. He spent months working on it to make it as scary as possible. He knew how important it was to keep pests away from his crops. So he gave it enormous straw arms that stretched out about six feet and big long legs that made it as tall as a tree. But the scariest thing about this scarecrow was its head. The farmer carved it himself out of a huge pumpkin. He spent countless days and nights perfecting his design until it was perfect. The scarecrow's face and head was so grotesque and ugly that even he was sometimes scared to look at it. But it was very effective, scaring away every rodent and bird that ventured near. The neighboring farm was owned by two young men who were brothers named Josh and Harold. They were lazy and never did much work around the farm which resulted in their crops being bad. They were jealous of the old farmer's success and were plotting against him. If they could drive him out of business, they could take over his farm and make more money. So one night, the brothers decided to sneak onto the old farmer's land. They stole his prized scarecrow and brought it back to their own house, where they stuffed it into an old closet so nobody would ever find it. The next day, the farmer woke up to find his hideous scarecrow missing and all his crops being eaten by rats and crows. He fell to his knees and cried, knowing that his farm would soon be out of business. Meanwhile, the brothers, Josh and Harold were watching from their own property and couldn't help laughing out loud when they saw the old man's tears of grief. Hearing the laughter, the old farmer came over and asked them if they knew what happened to his scarecrow. 
The brothers looked him right in the eye and said they had no idea where his precious scarecrow might be. But you know I'll go out of business and have to sell my farm if I can't find my scarecrow, said the farmer. Josh just laughed in his face, saying that's just your tough luck, isn't it? Sucks to be you, giggled Harold. The old farmer walked slowly back to his house, his head hanging down in defeat and depression. That night, as Josh and Harold had trouble sleeping, not because they felt any remorse, but because they couldn't get the image of the scarecrow's horrible twisted face out of their minds. They decided they would never be able to sleep as long as that ugly pumpkin head was in their house. So they got up and dragged the scarecrow out of the closet. Harold took a baseball bat and smashed the scarecrow's head to pieces until all that was left was little bits of pumpkin strewn around the floor. The brothers swept up the pumpkin head pieces and threw them in the trash. Then they went back to bed and were soon fast asleep, having put all thoughts of the disgusting scarecrow face out of their heads. Sometime after midnight, Josh and Harold were awoken by the sounds of scratching and clawing at their bedroom door. Did you forget to put the dog out? asked Harold, sleepily. WWW, we don't have a dog, stammered Josh. Suddenly the bedroom door burst open and a solitary long straw arm snaked in through the opening. Then a second arm thrashed around, followed by two long stick legs. The two brothers were frozen in fear and could only look with horror as the headless scarecrow's body rose up on its long stick legs and its long arms reached out for them in the darkness. Harold felt a cold sinewy, straw claw close around his ankle and screamed as loud as he could. He begged his brother Josh to help him. But Josh was already running out of the bedroom. Fleeing in terror, he ran down the hallway, crashed through the front door and out onto the moonlit road. He ran as fast as his legs could carry him, puffing and panting and screaming at the top of his voice. As he passed his neighbor's house, he saw the old farmer standing at his gate. In the moonlight, he could see the farmer just staring at him with a strange smile on his face. Josh kept running, his bare feet slapping against the rough gravel road. He glanced back over his shoulder and saw something that scared him to his very soul. He saw the scarecrow running along the road close behind him. It was gaining on him, coming closer and closer. And that wasn't all he saw. He noticed that the scarecrow had a brand new head. And it looked a lot like Harold. There was a young man in his twenties who moved into a new apartment in New York City. The night he moved in, he was lying awake in bed when he heard strange noises coming from his kitchen. When he turned on the lights, he was horrified to see hundreds of tiny cockroaches scurrying under the refrigerator and kitchen cupboards. He realized that his apartment was completely infested with cockroaches. The next day, he asked one of his co-workers for advice about his cockroach problem. The co-worker said she had a similar problem and bought a pet gecko. She let the gecko loose at night and it took care of all the cockroaches. That evening, after work, the young man visited a pet store and bought a pet gecko. When he got home, he let the gecko go out of its cage. It immediately scurried into the kitchen and disappeared under the refrigerator. Then he heard a gecko gecko sound followed by a loud snap as the gecko's tongue caught hold of a cockroach and pulled it back into its mouth. Days went by, and Howard saw fewer and fewer cockroaches. The gecko was doing its job well. Occasionally, he would hear the telltale snap of the gecko's tongue and he knew it was catching the cockroaches and gobbling them up. One day after work, he was making dinner for himself when he saw the gecko chase one of the last cockroaches on the house under the refrigerator. He saw the cockroach scurry under it with the gecko far behind struggling to go under. That's when the young man realized that the gecko was getting bigger. He didn't see the gecko for days after that. Sometimes he would catch a glimpse of it out of the corner of his eye. Each time, it appeared to be bigger and bigger. One night, as he was lying in bed, he heard some strange noises in his room. Then he heard gecko, gecko and a loud snap. The next day, the young man was absent from work, but nobody thought anything of it. They just assumed he wasn't feeling well and decided to take a sick day. When he didn't show up the next day, or the next, 
his co-workers became very concerned and called the police. When the police knocked on the young man's door, they got no answer. They broke down the door and entered the apartment. In the bedroom, they found no traces of the young man, but were horrified to see an enormous gecko sitting on the bed. Its belly was huge and stretched and it just lay there lazily, regarding them with its big reptilian eyes. When they looked closer, they noticed something horrible. Sticking out of the corner of its mouth, there appeared to be a human foot, there was a young man in his twenties, who moved into a new apartment in New York City. The night he moved in, he was lying awake in bed when he heard strange noises coming from his kitchen. When he turned on the lights, he was horrified to see hundreds of tiny cockroaches scurrying under the refrigerator and kitchen cupboards. He realized that his apartment was completely infested with cockroaches. The next day, he asked one of his co-workers for advice about his cockroach problem. The co-worker said she had a similar problem and bought a pet gecko. She let the gecko loose at night and it took care of all the cockroaches. That evening, after work, the young man visited a pet store and bought a pet gecko. When he got home, he let the gecko go out of its cage. It immediately scurried into the kitchen and disappeared under the refrigerator. Then he heard a gecko gecko sound followed by a loud snap as the gecko's tongue caught hold of a cockroach and pulled it back into its mouth. Days went by, and Howard saw fewer and fewer cockroaches. The gecko was doing its job well. Occasionally, he would hear the telltale snap of the gecko's tongue and he knew it was catching the cockroaches and gobbling them up. One day after work, he was making dinner for himself when he saw the gecko chase one of the last cockroaches on the house under the refrigerator. He saw the cockroach scurry under it with the gecko far behind struggling to go under. That's when the young man realized that the gecko was getting bigger. He didn't see the gecko for days after that. Sometimes he would catch a glimpse of it out of the corner of his eye. Each time, it appeared to be bigger and bigger. One night, as he was lying in bed, he heard some strange noises in his room. Then he heard gecko, gecko and a loud snap. The next day, the young man was absent from work, but nobody thought anything of it. They just assumed he wasn't feeling well and decided to take a sick day. When he didn't show up the next day, or the next, his co-workers became very concerned and called the police. When the police knocked on the young man's door, they got no answer. They broke down the door and entered the apartment. In the bedroom, they found no traces of the young man, but were horrified to see an enormous gecko sitting on the bed. Its belly was huge and stretched and it just lay there lazily, regarding them with its big reptilian eyes. When they looked closer, they noticed something horrible. Sticking out of the corner of its mouth, there appeared to be a human foot. The Spanish Boys is a ghost story from Spain about two friends who decide to become grave robbers to impress their friends. There were two boys in Spain who were always up to mischief. Their names were Juan and Carlos and they were 13 years of age. The Spanish Boys wanted a good horror story to tell their friends. After much thought, they hit upon the idea of going into the local graveyard and digging up a skeleton. The boys knew this would be a horrible thing to do, but they liked the idea of becoming grave robbers. They were sure their friends would be impressed. The irresponsible boys waited until nightfall so that nobody would see them, then stealthily made their way to the cemetery. After climbing over the wall, they waited for a few minutes to make sure the graveyard was deserted. One of the boys spotted a shovel lying beside a freshly dug grave. This gave them the crazy idea that it would make for an even better story if they dug up a recently deceased corpse. Neighbors who lived beside the cemetery were awoken during the night by the sound of digging. It sounded as if the dead were rising from their graves. The alarmed neighbors grabbed their sticks, their machetes, and their guns for protection. Cautiously, they went out into the night and quietly searched for the source of the strange sounds. In the darkness, a voice was heard shouting, over there, and they saw two ghostly figures crouching over a grave. The terrified neighbors attacked the ghostly figures, beating, stabbing and hacking them in a fearful panic. Afterwards, they fled and returned to their beds, waiting for dawn to break. When they returned the next day, 
the neighbors found the dead bodies of two young boys lying on the ground. Both of them had been badly beaten. Their heads were cracked open and their brains had fallen out. The people were horrified when they realized that the figures they had seen the night before had not been ghosts at all. They were just two stupid kids who fancied themselves as grave robbers. As they stared at the two corpses, the people became worried that the police would come and arrest them for murder. So, they quickly dug two shallow graves and buried the broken bodies of the two foolhardy youths, before anyone else found out what had happened. The crime was covered up and the two boys were reported missing. Ever since then, they say the ghosts of the two Spanish boys haunt the graveyard every night, unearthing and desecrating the graves of the people who murdered them. At night, neighbors hear odd screams coming from the cemetery and strange voices yelling, where are our brains? Every morning, the remains of the dead are found dismembered and scattered throughout the cemetery. The Tribal Skull is a scary story about a man who finds a talking skull. A hunter was out in the forest one day, when he came across an odd-looking skull. The hunter said, what brought you here? The skull answered, talking brought me here. The hunter ran off and told everyone he knew about the talking skull. Eventually, word of the haunted tribal skull got back to the king. He tells the king, I found a dry human skull in the bush. It asks you how its father and mother are. The king says, never since my mother bore me have I heard that a dead skull can speak. The king summons the alkali, the saba, and the deji and asks them if they have ever heard the like. None of the wise men has heard the like and they decide to send guards out with the hunter into the bush to find out if his story is true and, if so, to learn the reason for it. The guards accompany the hunter into the bush with the order to kill him on the spot should he have lied. The guards and the hunter come to the skull. The hunter addresses the skull, skull, speak. The skull is silent. The hunter asks as before, what brought you here? The skull does not answer. The whole day long the hunter begs the skull to speak, but it does not answer. In the evening the guards tell the hunter to make the skull speak, and when he cannot, the guards kill the hunter in accordance with the king's command. When the guards are gone, the skull opens its jaws and asks the dead hunter's head, what brought you here? The hunter's severed head replies, talking brought me here, 